especially historians will appreciate it. Ah, here it is. Just make sure. Okay. Rick Perlstein narrates our tumultuous ties with such verve and insight that he validates the appellation given to him by the nation. He is the hyper-caffeinated Herodotus of the American century. <laughs> with no further ado, here's the latter-day, modern-day Herodotus. Senator King tells me that senators are just like you and me. And he, le he left behind his book, so I, I'm, I'm, I'm firmly a, a small-D Democrat, and uh, one of our principles is you snooze, you lose. So, uh, so I'm going to think up a trivia question, and um, <laughs> the winner will get uh, a review copy of my upcoming book. Autograph to Senator King? We'll tear out, we're, we'll tear out Senator King's page. <laughs> Uh, it's, a, it's a thrill back to be back in Skowhegan. My trip here in 1988 was um, a muddy pleasure. Um, and uh, last night I uh, had a delightful meal at the uh, Old Mill Pub, and there was a fantastic blues musician named Dave, Dave Mello, you might have seen around Maine. And uh, coming from the south side of Chicago, uh, I know my blues. Uh, so you guys have reason to be proud. There's some great stuff around here. Um, bipartisanship our subject for today. Um, and uh, David uh, apparently announced that I have some provocative thoughts on the subject. Now, I love compromise. Um, my girlfriend and I are beginning to build a life together, and I think we've, we've, we've kept things sane uh, according to the maxim, um, I know everything, but Judy is always right. <laughs> uh, so... Um, Keep in mind, uh, as I uh, deliver my remarks, uh, which fit nicely with Senator King's, that um, compromise is a marvelous ideal. Uh, bipartisanship is a marvelous ideal. And uh, to establish my uh, bona fides for that opinion, I'm actually uh, going to start out by uh, doing a reading from my upcoming book, The Invisible Bridge, uh, which is coming out in August. Uh, you guys uh, have the privilege of uh, being the first audience to hear a presentation from these pages. And uh, what I'm going to read from is uh, my section on uh, the House... In we lost the sound. Uh, House impeachment hearings uh, against Richard Nixon in the uh, summer of 1974. And uh, just to, to, to back up for um, the, the, the pups in the audience, in 1972, of course, uh, several burglars broke into the Democratic National Committee, and uh, it, not much uh, was made of it politically uh, until uh, hearings were established in 1973, uh, Senate hearings uh, run by a marvelous conservative Democrat of the name of, first person to shout it out gets a review copy. No, you got one. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Every day on TV, basically, the American people uh, flipped on their sets, and uh, their soap operas were preempted, and they would see White House officials uh, talking about things that they did that basically made them little better than um, mafia enforcers uh, at the command of their president, which was a deeply, deeply, as you can imagine, uh, traumatic uh, experience for a country that had already lost so much trust because of the Vietnam War, uh, so much division because of um, the civil rights movement and uh, the backlash against it. Um, and as this kind of process kind of wended its way uh, up to impeachment when it became evident to a lot of Americans that basically uh, everything that Richard Nixon had told the American people from 1972 on was serially being proven to be a lie over and over and over again, uh, the process moved uh, according to the Constitution into the House of Representatives uh, in which the Judiciary Committee uh, uh, basically began hearings to uh, decide uh, whether he should be impeached and uh, to vote on whether um, his trial should be forwarded to the Senate. Uh, so this is where we begin our remarks today. 
Shortly after 11 a.m. on July 24th, 1974, a hot, sticky, overcast Wednesday, the Supreme Court handed down its unanimous decision in Case 73-1766, United States versus Nixon. Reading its opening argument, a Nixon hater, and there were many, would have reason to worry. The court affirmed for the first time in its history that something called executive privilege did, in fact, exist. Executive privilege was what Richard Nixon said when the Senate Watergate Committee said, you got to let us interrogate your aides. He would say, no, I'm exerting executive privilege. What they have to say to me over the years was confidential. Therefore, they don't have to testify. This was an unprecedented doctrine that's spread uh, over the years. Uh, did, in fact, exist. The president had a right to keep his deliberation with subordinates from congressional scrutiny. Next, though, came the thermonuclear explosion. The man whom Nixon had appointed chief justice, reading out this next part in the courtroom, drew in a breath, then uttered, the generalized assertion of privilege must yield to the demonstrated specific need for the evidence in a pending criminal trial. Accordingly, the judgment under review is affirmed, meaning every subpoenaed tape of a conversation was now the property of the Congress of the United States. Just to, to recollect, Nixon taped everything in the Oval Office, and it was revealed during these hearings in the summer of 1973 that these tapes exist. Existed. There was an immediate constitutional crisis, whereby the special prosecutor and the House impeachment and the Senate uh, Watergate Committee tried to get control of these tapes, and Nixon exerted executive privilege and said they were his personal property. From the Western White House, uh, there was no immediate response. Then, after what seemed like an eternity, a statement was issued in the president's voice. While I am disappointed in the results, I respect and accept the court decision, and I have instructed Mr. St. Clair, his lawyer, to take whatever measures are necessary to comply with that decision in all respects. A cameraman asked, that's news? It was. That this president now accepted the authority of the Supreme Court was a relatively surprising proposition. The timing was remarkable. Only minutes later, Chairman Peter Rodino of New Jersey sat poised with his gavel in the air, waiting for the signal from a TV cameraman to smack it down to open the Judiciary Committee's public impeachment hearings. Nine counts were up for debate. The allegations ranged from Nixon's role in accepting bribes from the dairy industry and the multinational corporation International Telephone and Telegraph to his review refusal of Congress's subpoenas. Um, I just lost my page there. Uh, to his refusal of uh, Congress's subpoenas, his secret falsified bombing of Cambodia, his obstruction of justice in bribing defendants, his misuse of the CIA, his lying to investigators, his making up the story of John Dean's investigation, his misuse of federal funds to gussy up his private residences, and finally, his violation of the oath to faithfully execute the laws by deploying the IRS, FBI, and Secret Service in, quote, disregard of the constitutional rights of citizens. Each member got 15 minutes for opening statements. Rodino's counterpart in the Republican minority, Edward Hutchinson, said there wasn't sufficient evidence to go forward with hearings in the first place. A Republican. Jack Brooks, Democrat of Texas, returned in thunder, never in our 198 years have we had evidence of such rampant corruption in government. Robert Kastenmeier of Wisconsin, one of the committee's liberal firebrand Democrats, started quietly, conversationally, and ended near to a bone-crunching shout. Society, through its ex elected representatives, must condemn this conduct. Otherwise, we will cease to be a government of laws. I will therefore vote for the impeachment of Richard Nixon, and I do this with the belief that the House of Representatives will agree and that his trial in the Senate will result in his conviction and removal from office. There followed a hush. This was the first committee member to commit to the removal of the President of the United States. That ended fire to the presentation by Republican Charles Sandman of New Jersey, who Theodore White, White the making the president historian, uh, said his voice was a snarl, reminiscent of Joe McCarthy's 20 years before. 
Sandman called the inquiry the joke of the century and said only the wickedness of the liberal media made anyone think differently. Crowds overwhelmed the air conditioning. On TV, congressmen's skin glistened wet, much like another August day in 1948 when the youngest member of the House on American Activities Committee turned himself overnight into a national figure while questioning the accused communist Alger Hiss, the first time this strange, sweating man divided his country in two, into two irreconcilable groups of Americans, pro and anti, Richard Nixon. Tom Railsback of Moline, Illinois, the last Republican to speak this first day, earnestly, desperately, sought to cut through the division. Railsback owed this president. He was one of Congress's dozens of members who might not have been elected had it not for Richard Nixon. Once there, Railsback had been tapped for the Chowder and Marching Society, a social club for hot young Republican prospects, co-founded by Nixon in 1949. Now he spoke pensively, soberly, as if suppressing anguish. Richard Nixon had won re-election vote in his district with nearly two-thirds of the vote. Richard Nixon, quote, had treated me only kindly whenever I had occasion to be with him. He has done many wonderful things for this country. Someday historians are going to realize the contributions he has made. But, Railsback concluded, maybe it was time for him to go. Not, he said, for things like the IT team dairy bribes, the bombing of Cambodia, the income tax shenanigans. To impeach on those would be pettily partisan. He singled out instead areas where a conservative or a moderate or a liberal should be more concerned about the state of our government, what he called the abuses of power. The president's knowledge that John Dean was ordering the IRS commissioner to audit, audit McGovern's contributors. His knowledge within a week of the break-in of the plan to use the CIA to get the FBI to stop investigating the laundering of money through Mexico to cover up the break-in. Ordering Dean to falsify an exonerating Watergate report, even while Dean was ordered to figure out how to bribe the burglars into silence. Railsback spoke of mail from constituents who said the country could not afford to impeach a president. That was the bipartisan position of the time. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, could not afford to impeach a president. He, we'll, we'll get into those subtleties. He wondered if we could afford not to. For if we're not going to really try to get to the truth, you're going to see the most frustrated people, and it's going to make the period of LBJ in 1967 and 1968 look tame. So I hope we just keep our eyes and trying to get to the truth. The next morning... A Republican named Charles Wiggins, a good lawyer, made the first effective case for the president. He began, like Peter Rodino, booming out hosannas to equal justice under law. He spoke of how he had heard himself describe on television as the president's chief defender and how he had winced. In the context of the law, Mr. Chairman, personalities become irrelevant. The law requires that we decide the case on evidence. He then unfurled a dazzling forensic presentation that picked up from his point about the CIA, Railsback's point about the CIA, allowing that their interference with the investigation was an obvious wrongful act, but pointing out that in the committee's 38 volumes of evidence, there was not a word, ladies and gentlemen, of presidential knowledge and awareness of that wrongful act. No smoking gun. Simple as that. The argument drove others to distraction. William Hungate, Democrat of, Democrat of Missouri, said that if an elephant walked into a room, his Republican friends would ask for proof that it wasn't a mouse with a glandular problem. <laughs> but then a Republican, William S. Cohn of Maine, said if his colleagues woke up in the morning to a blanket of white, they would demand proof that it had snowed the white the night before. <laughs> Hamilton Fish, Jr., Republican of New York, conservative, said, of course, of course there was no smoking gun. The whole room was filled with smoke. And smoke, magicians know, make for magnificent distraction. Just so, Wiley Maine of Iowa, that's my favorite name of a congressman, Wiley Maine, <laughs> called the president's accusers extreme partisans, though they came from both parties. 
and asked why there had never been a congressional investigation of how Lyndon Johnson became a millionaire. Trent Lott, whose Mississippi district voted 85.2% to re-elect the president, recited a ledger full of statistics about how much the government had spent on the investigation. Could any man withstand such scrutiny, he said, uh, without any counterbalancing presentation of the other side of the story. Now, maybe there would have been a counterbalancing presentation had not the president in, uh, enjoined uh, the doctrine of executive privilege <laughs> when his aides were asked to testify before Congress. It took an unlike unlikely woman in school marmish's glasses to call the proceedings back from the brink of silliness. A minister's daughter and freshman congresswoman from Austin, Texas, Barbara Jordan, got her 15 minutes, though it only took her 13. She was black. She and Andrew Young of Georgia were the first two African Americans to be sent to Congress from the South since Reconstruction, and she did not shy from foregrounding the fact. Earlier today, she intoned solemnly, we heard the beginnings of the preamble to the Constitution of the United States, we the people. It's a very eloquent beginning, but when that document was completed on the 17th of September in 1787, I was not included in that we the people. You might say she played the race card. <laughs> Not always a bad thing. And then, because this young woman was one of the greatest orators in the United, the United States had ever produced, she did what great orators do. She loosened up her audience with a joke. I felt somehow for many years that George Washington and Alexander Hamilton just left me out by mistake. <laughs> now, however, we had a more perfect union. Now the Constitution made her an equal inquisitor. She pronounced with great rounded booming accents, anyone? My faith in the Constitution is whole, is complete, is total, and I'm not going to sit here and be an idle spectator to the diminution, diminution, the subversion, the destruction of the Constitution. And from that majestic foundation, she scolded her seniors with such a severe power that even hard-bitten reporters were mesmerized. I actually uh, originally wrote that they forgot to take notes. And uh, Elizabeth Drew, uh, who reported on um, the House hearings for The New Yorker, told me, well, some people were taking notes. So I had to call my publisher in a tizzy and say we need to change that sentence in the interest of historical accuracy. She pointed to a basic constitutional fact these colleagues had been too obtuse to honor, that a vote for an article of impeachment was not a vote to remove the president, only a license for a trial. Stop insulting the framers. They did not make the accusers and the judges the same person. She annihilated the argument that had been maintained for months about the standard for impeachment. The founders were perfectly clear that it was not a punishment for maladministration, nor for technically crimes, but... She quoted the Federalist number 65, a method of national inquest into the conduct of public men. She quoted the wise reminder of a former political scientist, Woodrow Wilson, that the Constitution's requirement of a two-thirds vote in the Senate guaranteed that nothing short of the grossest offenses against the plain law of the land will suffice to give them speed and effectiveness. She turned to the evidence on the record that as of June 23, 1972, the president knew that money from his re-election committee had been found at the possession of one of the burglars, and he knew that R.S.T. Howard Hunt had been earlier committing illegal acts on his behalf, and he knew that he had been recorded discussing how to shelter Hunt from prosecution. She quoted the opinion of James Madison, speaking at the Virginia Ratification Convention. If the president be connected in any suspicious manner with any person, and there be grounds to believe that he will shelter him, the House of Representatives can impeach. And she quoted Madison to the Constitutional Convention, that a president is impeachable if he attempts to subvert the Constitution. She repeated that if he attempts to subvert the Constitution. She concluded, if the impeachment provision in the Constitution of the United States will not reach the offenses charged here, then perhaps that 18th century Constitution should be abandoned to a 20th century paper shredder. That's some good lawyer in there. She yielded back the balance of her time, having efficiently laid out just what the president's defenders were demanding 
specifics of what he did wrong. It was one of the greatest speeches any American politician had ever delivered. This from a politician no one had heard of and live on TV. Though this being politics, she hardly changed any minds. The next day, debate began with Charles Sandman, the McCarthyite guy, whining, I want answers, and this is what I am entitled to. This is the charge, a charge against the President of the United States. He is entitled to know specifically what he did wrong. Now comes uh, the heroic bipartisanship. Sandman was shrieking against something called the Sarbanes Substitute, a carefully worked out impeachment article accusing the president of violating his constitutional oath to preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution and his duty to take care that the laws be faithfully executed by obstructing justice and delaying and impeding the investigation of the events of June 17, 1972, the burglary, and subsequently. The article was the product of a motley caucus of seven Republicans and seven moderate Democrats, all natural allies of Nixon, most from districts where Nixon got more than 62% of the vote in 1972. It would have been the easiest thing in the world for members like this to vote to save the president for political reasons. Instead, conscience had guided these seven to the conclusion that the president did deserve to be impeached, but that it had to happen in a bipartisan passionless manner. Rodino asked Representative Walter Flowers of Mississippi, whose constituents had given George McGovern only 22.9% of their vote, to gather the seven into a working team, actually that's supposed to be 14, into a working team to draft impeachment articles. They became known as the Fragile Coalition. It was by then plain that all but three of the committee's 21 Democrats, this is the House Judiciary Committee, would impeach the president on any charge that came to a vote. These were liberal hotheads, like the Mad Monk, <laughs> colleagues nicknamed for Father Robert Drynan, uh, a priest who very soon after would be um, given the choice of being a congressman or being a priest and chose the priesthood, uh, who had introduced his first impeachment resolution in 1973 over the secret bombing in Cambodia. Just to digress, um, um, Richard Nixon ordered massive ton tonnage of bombing to, to, um, to be rained down in the country of Cambodia, which was next to Vietnam, but we were not at war with. And <laughs> there was a great classic Doonesbury cartoon, which uh, a Cambodian peasant said, well, it wasn't secret to us. <laughs> um, but what he did was basically um, he had two sets of ledgers uh, a lot of the uh, top brass in the Air Force didn't even know about it, and um, he basically created um, falsified records that had been uh, um, announced, that had been discovered in uh, the summer of 1973. Working to strike down Drynan's charge about Cambodia was the soul of the Fragile Coalition's reasoning. Large majorities of both parties had voted funds to continue the bombardment, so how could they impeach over that? Ten of the 17 committee Republicans, meanwhile, seemed willing to go to their graves defending their president. This was uh, the kind of recriminatory atmosphere that strengthened the coalition's resolve. The House Judiciary Committee must not be a lynch mob. Any legitimate grounds for impeachment had to represent continuing offenses, had to be bipartisan, had to be a self-evident emanation from the Oval Office itself. Maybe then impeachment could become an opportunity, an opportunity to show, as the fragiles like to say amongst themselves, that the system worked. That maybe extremism, that awful consequence of the cacophonous 1960s, could be excised from American life once and for all. This was serious business. Fifty Capitol Police now lined the Senate side entrance, entrance when Vice President Ford was presiding, a platoon of their motorbikes forming a wedge around his car, in addition to his regular Secret Service convoy, as if for someone who was about to become president. And so, Saturday night, after a long day of parliamentary wrangling, came the slow, stately roll call in the Sarbanes substitute. Twenty-seven in favor, eleven opposed. A committee vote of 71% for impeachment. That meant it probably would happen. Almost immediately after that vote, 
Peter Rodino hurriedly cleared the hearing room. Reports were that a plane had taken off from National Airport with the intent of crashing into the Rayburn office building, perhaps in coordination with military units loyal to the president. The reports seemed credible enough. These were death-haunted times. Back in February, a madman named Samuel Beek drove to Baltimore Washington International Airport, shot an airport cop, stormed a DC-10 on the runway, and threatened to blow up the plane with a gasoline bomb unless the pilots flew it into the White House. Two weeks later, the media reported that he, if he had chosen the less secure airport in his hometown of Philadelphia, he might have succeeded. Inflation was up above 12%. The currency markets were on the verge of panic. Oil, $2.70 a barrel in September, now went for 11 bucks. The world seemed nigh unto apocalypse. Two weeks before the impeachment hearings, the perky hostess of the chat show Suncoast Digest in Florida, who incorporated homemade puppets into her program, was angry that the station owner had told the staff to concentrate on blood and guts and had cut away from her show to cover a shootout at a local restaurant. She began her broadcast with an uncharacteristic hard news segment with film from a restaurant shooting. The film jammed in the projection, at which point she announced, in keeping with Channel 4E's policy of bringing the latest in blood and guts, and in living color, you're going to see another first attempted suicide. She then shot herself in the head. The sane were a fragile coalition. Many Americans are in the middle of a depression, ran an advertisement in the Chicago Tribune for the psychology columnist Dr. Joyce Brothers, and a lot of people feel trapped and helpless to change things. If the State of the Union has put you in an unhappy state of mind, take heart. There are things you can do as an individual to attack the national problems and to fight your own depression. Find out how to beat the blahs in this three-part series starting Monday. So, <laughs> uh, go on Amazon and buy the book if you like that. Like that. <laughs> but um, the important thing to reflect upon is how powerful and soothing and redemptive was the ability to choose to achieve a genuine bipartisanship in a time of national trauma. It's a wonderful ideal, and it's a very seductive ideal. Uh, and we're hearing it a lot now. Uh, Christopher Matthews, the uh, MSNBC commentator, um, uh, came out with a book. <laughs> I thought it was called Tipper and Gipper, but it's called Tip and the Gipper, When Politics Works. And uh, it's about how Tip O'Neill and Ronald Reagan used to knock back cocktails after work, much like the senator talked about the pleasures of the Senate prayer breakfast uh, and uh, the ideal of being friends with those whom you oppose politically. The idea is if we're just able to achieve this sort of comity, if we can just know each other's children, uh, make friends with another, one another, that um, maybe that's the way to recover this lost ideal. Now it's an important point to note in what I'm going to say that Chris Matthews is an MSNBC commentator, and MSNBC is supposed to be one poll on this, well, if you want to know the Democratic side of the story, you just watch NBC, and then if you want the Republican side of the story, you just watch Fox, and that we're kind of living in different realities. But the fact of the matter is, if a Fox host wrote a book saying, you know, we need to hang out more with Democrats, he'd probably be fired that day. So we're not talking about a symmetry here, and that's going to be a big theme of what I'm going to be saying next. Um, if I can change the slide. Right. I'm just going to leave that in the background uh, for a little while, get back to it in more detail. Um, I'm going to read the, read the remarks of a young writer named uh, Christopher Smemo in the, the magazine Jacobin. And she's talking about the discourse and the, the, the discussion we have about why aren't there more Republicans like Margaret Chase Smith anymore? Why aren't there moderate Republicans like there used to be? She says, the rise of the Tea Party has generated powerful nostalgia 
for a generation of sane and reasonable Republicans. Once upon a time, so this tale goes, the breed of moderates were willing to this breed of moderates were willing to compromise to accommodate many of the basic reforms of the New Deal. It venerates a political movement exemplified by the presidency of Dwight Eisenhower, who claimed in an off-quoted letter to his right-wing brother Edgar that total electoral annihilation would greet any Republican who, quote, attempted to abolish Social Security, unemployment insurance, and eliminate labor laws and farm programs. Eisenhower's begrudging accommodation of the welfare state represented a tactical concession to specific elements of the political order brought into existence by the reforms of the New Deal. But another set of Republicans who emerged in the 1930s and 1940s at the state and local level across the urban industrial Northeast, Midwest, and West Coast went further. They made much larger strategic concessions as self-identified liberal Republicans. And as this young writer points out, these were the places where working people had mobilized most effectively under the auspices of the New Deal. You were more likely to have a moderate Republican in a place when you had li- where you had liberal Democrats putting pressure on them. A significant segment of the Republican Party effectively New Dealized itself in an effort to adapt to these insurgencies. Liberal Republicans not only recognized the legitimacy of unions, they also bowed to organized pressure to identify poverty, segregation, and job discrimination as so- social problems requiring government intervention. They acknowledged that a mass production and mass consumption society needed an expansive state to govern itself. It is remarkable that the working class, when organized, has the power to reshape even a conservative political party. This writer is arguing that the structural conditions for effective bipartisanship, that the, the necessary and sufficient cause before you can have bipartisanship, is effective partisanship. Or if you prefer, some sort of rough ideological parity between the two parties. Uh, This is the opposite of the case we have now. We can flip to the next slide. This is a chart by uh, two political scientists, uh, Kenneth Poole and um, a fellow named Rosenthal. I don't remember his first name. What we're looking at is the years 1879 to 2011, and a statistical index called DW Nominate, which is a fancy uh, method of figuring out each contested vote in the House or in the Senate. This happens to be the House. Uh, the number of, dem- number of uh, Democrats and Republicans who vote on the liberal side of the question and the conservative side of the question. If an equal number of uh, liberals, Democrats, and uh, Republicans vote on both sides of the question, we have perfect bipartisanship and both lines would be at the center in this zero, zero, zero. What we have is hmm, rough parity between the two parties. In fact, the strongest parity, the least bipartisanship, I mean the most bipartisanship and the least partisanship in the period in which liberalism was at its strongest, the New Deal era and World War II, when we had a strong liberal democratic president, strong unions, Congress, uh, liberal congressmen proposing things like uh, Medicare, Medicaid, uh, things like that. The Republicans become less partisan. Slowly, and I write about this in my three books, conservatives take over the Republican Party, and something else happens. The senator talked about how the parties uh, used to have both have liberals and conservatives in them, and there was lots of overlap. One of the main reasons why that overlap started was because the Democrats proclaimed themselves a party that supported, on a national level, civil rights laws. And the racists all left the Democratic Party. The overlap ended. Starting in 1975, when the operational control of the Republican Party was handed over to the conservative movement, um, and Richard Nixon was gone. One of the things Richard Nixon was very good at was containing the right-wing kind of ideological energies in his party, doing things like passing moderate and liberal laws like the EPA and um, the Clean Air Act. You see the partisanship of the Republican Party skyrocketing. 
whereas the Democratic Party pretty much stabilizes. I'm going to quote um, two political scientists who are kind of um, seen as kind of arbiters of uh, the official kind of bipartisan consensus in Washington for many years, Norm Ornstein and uh, Thomas Mann. You've probably read op-eds by them. You used to see them a lot on the Sunday shows. They recently wrote a book on partisanship called It's Worse Than You Think. They wrote a Washington Post op-ed. We have been studying Washington politics and Congress for more than 40 years, and never have we seen them more dysfunctional. In our past writings, we have criticized both parties when we believed it was warranted. Today, however, we have no choice but to acknowledge the core problem lies with the Republican Party. The GOP has become an insurgent outlier in American politics. It is ideologically extreme, scornful of compromise, unmoved by conventional understanding of facts, evidence, and science, and dismissive of the legitimacy of its political opposition. When one party moves this far from the mainstream, it makes it nearly impossible for the political system to deal constructively with the, con the country's challenges. While the Democrats may have moved from their 40-yard line to their 25, see the chart, the Republicans have gone from their 40 to somewhere behind the goalpost. This cuts very strongly against the Washington consensus that you heard the senator uh, express, that the problem is uh, partisanship on both sides, that the system has become more extreme. And by the way, when these two guys started saying this, you stopped seeing them on the Sunday talk shows. Somehow the invitations got lost in the mail. Is the problem also ideological extremists in the Democratic Party? Again, look at the chart. Uh, the Democrats, uh, the Republicans were less partisan during the period in which liber liberalism was strongest in the Democratic Party. So again, my counterintuitive argument, we can't have more bipartisanship, we can't solve national problems until we have more partisanship among Democrats. What James Kenneth Galbraith talk, talked about in the context of the economy, countervailing force. Without that, each act of compromise merely serves to move the center of the country further to the right. Without mad monks on both sides, there can be no fragile coalition. But now the mad monks are all on one side. Um, the senator, for example, talked about the Common Sense Caucus. These were, um, this is the group of senators that Susan Collins convened to end the impasse over uh, the government shutdown. Now, the striking thing left out about that account in which these heroic compromisers got together over drinks and figured out a way to find a modus vivendi is the actual budget that Congress ended up signing off on was stingier, lower, than Paul Ryan's original proposal. The compromise was the Tea Party budget. That's what happens when you have this asymmetrical polarization. Each compromise moves the center further to the right. Let's go back to the Benghazi slide. Peter Rodino did not have a logo for the House Judiciary Committee. Sam Irvin did not have advertisements for the Watergate Committee. In fact, Rodino was so obsessed with building a dispassionately nonpartisan inquiry that he hired a Republican as his lead investigator. In turn, that investigator, John Doerr, would not hire anyone who had gone on the record with a public opinion on impeachment. He would be asked to speak and give speeches in his home district, but he refused to do so. He said, they want a bell ringer of a speech against Mr. Nixon, and I just can't give it. Most of the sessions, unlike the Benghazi sessions, were secret, so they could deliberate in confidence. When they finally became public, Jimmy Breslin, uh, the columnist, said that Doerr presented his case so dispassionately that the level of detail, quote, approached life. <laughs> it was as non-political as a political process could be. In fact, the only person who man managed to get political hay out of this was Ronald Reagan. Uh, he thought, figured out a partisan way to interpret it. He said such labor deliberateness was intentional. 
He says, I sometimes suspect the Rodino committee of trying to keep this thing going through the election year. But let's return to Benghazi, and as it happens to Ronald Reagan. What is Benghazi? Right? We have this tragedy of uh, an American ambassador um, basically being assassinated by a mob in Libya. Um, and it's completely motivated uh, Republican attempts to uh, delegitimate the president. Um, recently, Jane Mayer of The New Yorker commented about events when she was covering Lebanon for The New Yorker. Or the Washington Post, I'm sorry. She said, around dawn on April 23rd, 1983, I was in Beirut, Lebanon, when a suicide bomber drove a truck laden with the equivalent of 21,000 pounds of TNT into the heart of a marine compound, killing 241 servicemen. The, the U.S. military command had left a vehicle gate wide open and ordered the sentries to keep their weapons unloaded. When I arrived on the scene a short while later to report on it for the, excuse me, the Wall Street Journal, the Marine barracks were flattened. Thirteen more servicemen later died from urge injuries, making it the single deadliest attack on our Marines, American Marines since the Battle of Iwo Jima. Six months earlier, militants had bombed the U.S. Embassy in Beirut, killing 63 more people, including 17 Americans. Among the dead were seven CIA officers. There were more than enough opportunities to lay blame for the horrific losses at high U.S. officials' feet, but unlike today's Congress, congressmen did not talk of impeaching Ronald Reagan, nor were there any subpoenas to cabinet members. This was true even though, then as now, the opposition party controlled the majority in the House. Tip O'Neill, the Democratic Speaker of the House, was no pushover. He, like today's opposition leaders in the House, demanded an investigation, but a real one, and only one. Instead of playing it for political points, a House committee undertook a serious investigation. Two months later, it issued a report finding very serious errors in judgment by officers on the ground as well as responsibility up the military chain of command. In other words, Congress actually undertook a useful investigation that made helpful recommendations. The report's findings were, by the way, bipartisan. <laughs> In March of 1984, three months after Congress issued its report, militants struck American officials in Beirut again, this time kidnapping the CIA's station chief, Bill Buckley, uh, not, not the, the magazine editor. <laughs> uh, he was tortured and murdered. Um, Congress held no public hearings and pointed no fingers. If you compare the cost of the Reagan administration's serial security lapses in Beirut to the cost of Benghazi, it's clear that what has really deteriorated in the intervening three decades was not the security of American government personnel working abroad, it's the behavior of American congressmen at home. Maybe we're to the, we're to the point that uh, a Margaret Chase Smith today should write a declaration of Congress about today's Republicans. I'll skip the part about global warming. It's too depressing. <laughs> I'll have a little reading from the end of uh, the next chapter of my book with some final thoughts. Of course, we all know how the story ends. Uh, a bipartisan impeachment effort uh, that led Nixon to resign in disgrace. Gerald Ford became president. The next morning, uh, he was sworn in. Actually, uh, Nixon said he was going to be, uh, he was resigning effective noon the next day. The next day was April 9th, I mean August 9th, and then shortly after noon, uh, there was uh, this ceremony. The dignitaries standing in chairs still in place after Nixon's maudlin farewell speech to his staff couldn't stop beaming. Like people at a marriage ceremony where the bride looked exquisite. After Chief Justice Warren Burger put forth the same words George Washington first intoned 185 years before to preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution, he stopped for the briefest moment, letting those glorious words sink in. The newly invested Chief Executive kissed beautiful Betty Ford upon both cheeks, and it was hard not to swell up inside. The Chief Justice announced, 
ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States. And hearing someone other than Richard Nixon introduced that way, and seeing the pride in the faces of his four handsome children, it was hard not to swell up again. He spoke for less than eight minutes. Not an inaugural address, he said, not a fireside chat nor a campaign speech, just a little straight talk among friends. He addressed these friends directly. Since he was acutely aware that he hadn't been elected, he said, I ask you to confirm me as your president with your prayers. And I hope that such prayers will also be the first of many. And he told them that since he had campaigned for neither the presidency nor the vice presidency, he was not subscribed to any partisan platform and was indebted to no man and only one woman, <laughs> my dear wife. <laughs> Nixon used his wife in speeches too most famously in the Checkers speech when she gazed up at him with adoration so sanctimonious that the humorist Mort Saul uh, <laughs> said she ought to have been knitting an American flag. But when Jerry did it, it sounded just right, sincere, as did his affirmation that those who confirmed him as vice president were of both parties, elected by all the people and acting under the Constitution in their name. He pledged to be president of all the people, unlike you-know-who, and said he believed that truth is the glue that holds government together, not our government, but civilization itself. In all my public and private acts as your president, I expect to follow my instincts of openness and candor, with full confidence that honesty is always the best policy in the end. My fellow Americans, our long national nightmare is over. Our Constitution works. Our great republic is a government of laws and not men. Here, the people rule. A great movement. How can we get there again? Uh, Senator King uh, joked about his colleague, his Republican colleague, who said, how do you vote yes? <laughs> um, but he said a lot of, th that, was like, that, was a, that was a really revealing, fascinating detail. But he said a lot of things I thought were not quite right. I mentioned the Paul Ryan budget uh, becoming the compromise position. Um, he said that both sides are inflexible. But how many Obamacare deadlines have to be extended before the president, uh, uh, does the president need to extend before the senator is able to say publicly that the president is in fact quite flexible, but faces historically inflexible opposition? He mentioned gerrymandering, and that's a very important issue. Uh, when only activists vote in the primaries, um, you get very extreme candidates, uh, very extreme general election candidates. But really that dynamism, that dynamic o still only exists on uh, one side. And I'll end um, with a um, brief story. Uh, in Florida, the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee, which is job is to recruit candidates uh, this year, recruited a candidate to run in a contested election in Florida. And the guy they chose was a Marine, which is a splendid thing, and also um, a man who had only declared that he had switched his registration from Republican to Democrat a week before the announcement of his candidacy. Uh, that's what the Democratic Party does. It's a party that uh, has sees uh, these days as its goal of fainting to the center. Uh, turns out that this guy, whose um, name is Ed Janney, uh, had falsified his... <laughs> <laughs> falsified his resume, so he had, to, um, he had to withdraw from the race. And the guy who had originally wanted to run, who was an African-American uh, activist who had kind of been big-footed out of the race by the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee, uh, is running in his stead. So this is my final argument, that if we believe that we need to return to the kind of bipartisanship of yore when problems were solved, when difficult problems like how to remove a president were solved, we need strong countervailing power on both sides. We need a more ideological Democratic Party in addition to a less ideological Republican Party. It's a counterintuitive conclusion, but I really do think that there is no other way. I thank you.